Hi, it's Dwyer. Monday, February the 24th, 2020. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk boxing, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. <clears throat> Losing my voice here. Just consider this a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let me just say, <clears throat> big weekend for us, we structure bets, we hedge bets to reduce risks. So in the pre-fight video, which is still up and will remain up, we suggested a hedge on the Tyson Fury Deontay Wilder fight. The first part was to take the under 10 and a half rounds. Right? Understand, we were trying to get around at the time I placed my bet a minus 110 on both sides of the aisle. By the time the men entered the ring, the late money was actually on Wilder and changed the line a little bit. But understand, there was plenty of room to bet here, even though the line was a minus 110 Wilder to win with a minus 110 Fury to win. So, the bet I recommended was to take the under 10 and a half rounds. This way you got both fighters up to the midway point of the 11th round, hedged with Tyson Fury to win the fight. Now that was the hedge cha-ching. More beer for us, it's Christmas in February. You won on the under 10 and a half, you won on Tyson Fury to win the fight. You won both halves of the bet. More importantly, by the time this fight got to the fifth round, and you realize that Wilder's only chance of winning the fight, realistically, was to get a stoppage, you understood that you were already safe. In other words, you had already made your money back because you knew that you already had both fighters by KO up to the midway point of the 11th round. And of course, you had Tyson Fury to win the fight. Now the tip off for this fight, when you knew this fight was gonna be over, was before the fight. Triple H visits the locker room of Tyson Fury. And Fury is cool, calm, collected, laughing. You would have thought it was Yui Fury fighting. You would have thought that Tyson Fury was just a member of the entourage. Fury had no concerns in the world. You thought to yourself, watching it, either this is a con job, a guy weighing 271 pounds, who is out of shape, and who wants to convey some kind of false sense of confidence before the fight. You thought it was either that, or you thought that Fury had figured out the math of the fight. Fury and Sugar Hill, a trainer who you need to remember. Understand, this is Emmanuel Stewart's disciple, right? They had figured out the math of the fight and knew it was going to be an easy fight. Make no mistake, this fight was an easy fight once you saw it unfold. Well, let me just say, they figured out the math of the fight. Deontay Wilder, and this is just different levels of boxer, right? As I've been saying here for years, Tyson Fury has a higher ceiling than everyone else boxing at heavyweight. Right? He is a great fighter. Now, this is not to say that great fighters don't lose. I thought Lennox Lewis was a great fighter. Lewis lost to Oliver McCall, lost to Haseem Rockman, avenged both. Um, let's forget the Lewis <coughs> Vitali Klitschko fight. I consider Vitali Klitschko to be a great fighter. <coughs> Vitali Klitschko panics in a fight against Chris Bird, loses that fight. Great fighters can lose. Ali lost. 
right? Larry Holmes. I saw Call the Truth Williams beat Larry Holmes. And then, of course, they ripped off Call the Truth Williams, right? Larry Holmes, people might remember, was on the canvas against Ronaldo Snipes. He was on the canvas against Ernie Shavers. Larry Holmes was a great fighter. When we say great, that separates these guys from the very good. That separates these guys from the contenders of the moment. We're talking about guys who separate themselves, who in an era really are the best in their weight class. In my opinion, that's who Tyson Fury is. So let's talk about the math of the fight. Deontay Wilder, a very good fighter, right? I do believe he's a Hall of Famer because of the history. Understand, going into this fight, he was unbeaten. He was a five-year reigning heavyweight champion. He had stopped, or at least dropped, everyone he had faced, right? Remains to Vern, goes the distance the first fight, doesn't make it to the second round, the second fight. Tyson Fury, the first fight, hits the canvas multiple times. With that resume, I say he's in the Hall of Fame, right? You can't control the heavyweight division by KO fashion for half a decade and not be a Hall of Famer. But let's be real here. Deontay Wilder is a very good heavyweight in the moment. He's a sign of the times, right? I don't consider him to be what we call in the trade an all-time great. In other words, Deontay Wilder for the last five years, right, emblematic of this era, was one of the best heavyweights in the world, right? As Tyson Fury left the stage, dealt with some demons, went to rehab, gained a lot of weight, came back, fought guys you never heard of, right? Just to understand that that era belonged in part to Deontay Wilder. But an all-time great requires a little bit more. It's when you're looking at a fighter and you realize, my God, when this guy puts it together, this is historical. So think about what you saw and what you didn't see. Because it shows you the difference between the fighters, right? People got carried away when Tyson Fury, three fights into a comeback. Has anyone done the math on this? <laughs> the guy beats Vladimir Klitschko years ago. Then three fights into a comeback against opposition. The first two fights on the comeback where he has to maintain his weight, deal with drug addiction, right? Deal with mental health issues. As he's getting in shape following his cousin, Yui Fury, to his fights, he gets in the ring in his third fight back. Third fight back. And then goes the distance against an unbeaten, multi-year reigning heavyweight champion. Not only that, even the people who think that first fight was a draw, and it wasn't. Tyson Fury won that fight by multiple rounds. But understand, going into the 12th round, had the fight ended after the 11th round, it's clear that Tyson Fury, on his third fight back, third fight back, understand, during his absence, he's missing years of boxing. On his third fight back, he was ahead of Deontay Wilder going into the 12th round of their fight. Now, fighters know practice makes perfect. You don't have your timing back when you hop in the ring after a long absence. Tyson Fury was just getting his timing back. He was just figuring things out. Understand, understand where he was. He had a trainer who he was just learning. Ben Davison, 
right? The corners knew. His body is getting back to where it was. And yet you mean to tell me that after he is ahead against Deontay Wilder, going into that 12th round, after he gets off the canvas, by the way, in that 12th round, and wins the rest of the round, you mean to tell me that people actually thought the casinos actually priced this fight where the odds were competitive with both fighters? If Wilder couldn't beat a rusty Tyson Fury, three fights into Tyson Fury's comeback, how was he going to be <laughs> Tyson Fury, who was actually in the gym, who actually fought unbeaten fighters, who was more than three fights into his comeback? So think about what you saw. You saw Deontay Wilder in the ring, and guess what, folks? He was looking exactly like Deontay Wilder. No change in style whatsoever. You know his game plan. Throw some jabs, come over the top and hit you in the chin with a straight right hand from distance. Right? Tyson Fury, excuse me, Deontay Wilder was Deontay Wilder. Nothing changed. Now let's talk about Tyson Fury. What you didn't see was Tyson Fury operating from a southpaw stance, throwing a right jab, right? Throwing a very mean straight left hand. Understand, Tyson Fury fought, I believe it was Kevin Johnson, fought most of the fight that way. What you didn't see was the Tyson Fury of the first fight. Tyson on the balls of his feet. Dancing around. Sticking and moving away. Right, think about that. Instead, you have a Tyson Fury here on his front foot. Right? On his front foot. You have a different guy here. He's on his front foot. Now let me just say, I thought the fight would be a little bit different. Right? In the pre-fight video, I said Tyson Fury has a shot at a KO here. But I thought Fury was going to try to smother Deontay Wilder's straight right hand. I thought Fury was going to come in like this, have his right like this. And I thought he was going to come in and throw left jabs and left hooks. Well, he and Sugar Hill were far beyond that. Tyson Fury, who has a very good left hook, right, has a very good left hook. Hardly ever throws it in this fight. What he and Sugar Hill come up with is Tyson Fury using his legs. He's not dancing. Understand, you can use your legs without dancing. If you look at a film of this fight, what leaps out at you is Fury's foot speed. Right? Fury's on air. Wilder's tethered to the canvas. Wilder is plotting. Fury is able to move where he wants on demand at 6'9", weighing over 270 pounds. To put that in perspective, ask yourself whether great athlete LeBron James in the ring would look as agile as Tyson Fury. Don't get fooled by the muscle mass and lack of definition. Fury's a much better athlete, much more coordinated than Deontay Wilder. So the first two rounds are harrowing to me, right? The worst possible outcome for me in terms of how I see the future of the heavyweight division. Not the bet, because I had the under 10 and a half. But the worst 
outcome for me would have been Fury going in there and walking into a straight right hand like Dominique Brazil did against Deontay Wilder. What Sugar Hill and Fury come up with is Fury and Fury's hands are low. He actually has his chin exposed. He's not doing this like I was hoping he would. He has his chin exposed somewhat. But what they do is they decide not to throw left hooks. When Wilder, who comes out, he has his legs in the first two rounds. He hasn't been hit in the body. He hasn't been roughed up yet. He hasn't been bum-rushed over to the side of the ropes. Wilder's there trying to set up the right hand, and Fury just sticks his left hand out. Look at the film. He just sticks his left hand out to make sure he has distance. When Wilder throws the right hand, Fury just rolls away from it and backs up. What's important is what happens after that. Fury on demand. Because he has some of the best legs in the sport. Let me even go one step further. In the comment section of this video, because I know I have longtime boxing fans watching this video, tell me a guy this size with this mobility, with this level of foot speed. After Wilder throws the right hand, Fury moves away, right? He's not throwing left hooks. He's not getting close on that side. He and Sugar Hill have a two-handed strategy. So Fury just sticks his arm up to make sure he's far enough away. Wilder, who has ring coverage, throws the right hand. Fury moves back. Then, like Marvin Hagler against Thomas Hearns, Fury just moves in, right? His legs can get him anywhere in the ring. So what happens is he knows Wilder's only knockout punch is a straight right hand from distance. So Fury then starts coming inside. Right? He's too close. He smothers Wilder. But not the right hand. He doesn't have to. Because once he gets close enough to Deontay Wilder, Wilder cannot throw that right hand. Right? He just, he just can't. Also, Fury is coming over the top with a straight right of his own. Fury's going hunting. Let me also say too, big heavyweights. George Foreman's one of the best I've seen at this. Understand they don't have to hit you to hurt you. What they could do is touch you with their upper body. So you have 271 pounds of Tyson Fury coming in and bouncing up against Deontay Wilder, right? Fury not only is bouncing up against Deontay Wilder, and understand the weight gap. One guy's above 270, one guy weighs 230. 230 at 6'7", he's slender. He's not ready to have this big man bouncing up against him. Well, it gets worse. In the fifth round, Fury, in addition to coming in and bouncing up against him and leaning on him, Fury's also doing things. I think the broadcast got it wrong. Fury's also doing things like he's throwing punches behind. And I, I thought this was deliberate. He's throwing punches behind Deontay Wilder's head. Because if Wilder moves his head back, that punch would have ended the fight. So 
it gets so ridiculous in the fifth round that Fury, who's a master inside, in other words, it's not just punches, it's throwing his body around, it's him bouncing up against you, it's him wrestling you, it's wrestling moves. So here on the telecast, you have Lennox Lewis, who figured out that Andrew Galata could not throw power shots backing up. So Lewis, in one of the heavyweights division's best fights of the last 30 years, comes in, jumps in on Andrew Galata, gets him backing up, destroys him in the first round. You have Lennox Lewis on the telecast, and you have Andre Ward on the telecast. Understand, Andre Ward's fighting Mikel Kessler, who was the favorite. Kessler was viewed as a beast. Rather than run away from Kessler... Andre Ward came inside on Kessler in one of the better super middleweight fights of the last 30 years. Kessler claimed he was being headbutted. No, he was being crowded. Kessler couldn't get his shots off. Right? It's, it's the best fight against Kessler. I mean, I'm just telling you. I know the Joe Calzaghe-Kessler fight was more highly touted. Both guys were unbeaten coming in. I know the Carl Frotch series of Kessler fights featured some high-end boxing. Kessler was practically defenseless against Andre Ward. Right? Well, here you have two guys who are masters between punches, who understand the art of spacing in boxing. And they just didn't talk about it enough. Right? Lennox Lewis actually was saying, hey, what Tyson Fury, who was inside, was doing was smothering his own punches. Lewis wanted Fury to back away. To back away from Deontay Wilder. Why would he do that? He's dominating the fight. Why give Wilder an opportunity to extend his arms? Fury's not deep in the pocket by chance. He and Sugar Hill have him deep in the pocket by design. It's a mismatch inside. It's a straight mismatch. Andre Ward was talking about the boxing teams and stuff like that. Now, while those guys were having that conversation, Kenny Bayless saw <laughs> the referee. They had the best ref in the game, in my opinion, in the ring. Kenny Bayless... And I thought Bayless makes a mistake here, but Kenny Bayless is watching Fury manhandle Wilder to the point where Fury grabs him in a headlock and is leaning on the back of his head. So, Kenny Bayless takes a point away from Fury. Let me just say this too. You want to know how good Tyson Fury is? Fury, while he's mauling, Deontay Wilder. I mean, just mauling him. Fury throws a left hand. It's a left hand to Wilder's body. It drops Wilder. Right? It drops Wilder. So let me just say this. When Wilder gets off the canvas... He's not moving well. It looks like something is wrong. Now, I know he has blood streaming out of his ear. These ear injuries can throw off your equilibrium. I know after the fight, Wilder's saying that he had a foot problem. Right? A leg problem that hindered him. But what you need to know is that he was in against a great fighter. And there he was limping around, and the great fighter knew all he had was a straight right hand from distance. The great fighter also knew when he got inside and he bounced his 271 pound body off this guy, it was impacting this guy. Right? The clinches, I know, while uh, Fury's a little bit outside the lines and. There's a clinch where Fury, who's enjoying himself a lot, gets so excited that he sticks his tongue out and it looks like he's trying to lick blood. 
I wish I were kidding, off Wilder's neck. Right? Understand, Fury was in a zone. And what I want people to just think about for a second is the fact that this is only part of Fury's game. While Fury is mauling him, Roberto Duran style, on the inside in this fight, contrast that to the first fight where Fury is dancing around the ring behind a jab. Look at the left hand. I told you he has a great left hook. How many fighters in one camp with a new trainer can decide, okay, I'm not going to throw left hooks. I'm not going to put myself in a position where I'm close to Wilder on Wilder's right side. Instead, he is just throwing jabs, then he leaps in. I'm just telling you, if you look at just the feet, you understand that this big man is one of the best movers, whether you think he's great or not, in the heavyweight division in several years. So I agree with Mark Breland. If I'm in Deontay Wilder's corner and I see my guy getting mauled, I realize my guy is not going to land a straight right hand tonight. The other side's just too well prepared. I see the other guy knocking my guy down on left hands to the body. I realize my guy doesn't have the weight. My guy can't even keep the fight in the middle of the ring after the fifth round. In fact, from the start of the fifth round to the end of the fight, Deontay Wilder's just being pushed back up against the ropes. Right? If I'm Mark Breland and I see my fighter not looking good in his gait, right? Wilder looks like he's badly off balance. Right? I would throw in the towel. I know there's controversy. Wilder is a warrior. Let me just tell you, sometimes the people who love you have to protect you from yourself. Right? Wilder has one loss. He has a rematch clause that guarantees him 40%, 40% of the third fight between the two guys. He has to take that third fight, in my opinion, because there's big money and it's a nice payday. Right? I want the Anthony Joshua people to figure this out. These two guys came up with a plan where the winner of this fight gets 60% for the third fight and the loser gets 40 Right? Anthony Joshua could have been fighting these guys. He wasn't offering them splits like that. So as a result, Anthony Joshua was on the outside looking in. And of course, he's not going to step in the ring again with Andy Ruiz, even though they're 1-1 in their series. Right? Even though the person who suffered the bigger loss was Anthony Joshua. Let me also say this for legacy. Deontay Wilder is 34. Boxing's a dangerous sport. I'll agree. You know, Dwyer's rule of relativity for boxers is that fighters age more slowly in the heavyweight division. I agree he has. Years ahead of him if he wants it. But he just made over $25 million for this fight, right? We don't know the final number, but it's more than 25 mil. Understand, this fight set the record for the gate at the MGM in Vegas. Right? Think about that. So, so let me just say, if Wilder fights Fury a third time, right, and loses... I believe he's still a Hall of Famer. Had Roy Jones walked away from the sport after that first loss to Antonio Tarver, 
we'd be talking about Jones as one of the absolute best fighters in any division in the sport's history. Right hand Mike Tyson walked away from the sport after he lost to Buster Douglas. We'd be talking about Mike Tyson as one of the best fighters in the history of the sport. Right? If Deontay Wilder loses again to a great fighter, Tyson Fury, right? Wilder could then say, hey, I only lost to one man, while, of course, filling his bank account even more, right? He's a multimillionaire today, as it is. He'd get even more millions of dollars. He could then say, hey, you know what? We could talk about my missed opportunity in fighting Anthony Joshua. Half the historians can blame me. Half the historians can blame him. Uh, but I only lost to one man. And my KO record speaks for itself. And even the guy I lost to, I knocked down twice in a fight. I believe his legacy would be secured. I understand Wilder has something like eight kids. Right? He would have time. A lot more time than if he's in training and preparing for future fights. Right? He'd have a lot more time for his children. Understand, too, once you reach Wilder's stature, heavyweight champ for five years, right, the public's going to want him to only fight extremely dangerous men. Right? They would say, hey, we want to see you against Usyk. We want to see you against Joshua. We want to see you against Fury. Very tough road to travel. Figure out what happened to Mike Tyson. If you were a fan of boxing in the 1980s, you understood he had no peer at heavyweight. No peer at heavyweight. He loses to Buster Douglas. After that, he loses twice to Evander Holyfield. Right? The first fight's the key one. The second fight, he self-destructs, starts biting ears. The first fight, he's methodically deconstructed. He loses to Lennox Lewis. There's a Sugar Ray Robinson feel to him. Understand, Ray Robinson is the man at Welter. He is the man at Welter. When he's fighting at middle, suddenly guys like Gene Fulmer start roughing him up. Right? Some other guys start roughing him up at middleweight. He gets dropped by Rocky Graziano. Gets off the canvas, finishes Rocky, one of the better knockouts. But understand, Ray Robinson wasn't the dominant Ray Robinson at middleweight that he was at welterweight. Right? Mike Tyson went on in his career. I believe it hurt him legacy-wise. By contrast, Lennox Lewis runs into Vitaly Klitschko. Lewis says, that's it. There's no part of the Lewis record, where Lewis goes on and is losing to other fighters of that era, right? Understand, he avenges Oliver McCall. He avenges the Hasim Rockman loss, right? Deontay Wilder has a choice here. He's going to make millions more, right? as wealthy as he is, and he's wealthy. He's going to make millions more, right? Millions more fighting this third fight against Fury. If he leaves the stage at that point, you're going to have people down the road voting for the Hall of Fame. And someone's going to say, you know, this guy only lost to one man. This guy was heavyweight champ for five years. Right? One guy had his number. We're okay with that. If Wilder instead pivots, understand, you have a real hellacious fight coming up. Right? Joe Joyce against Daniel Dubois. Both men, very dangerous. If he pivots and he fights the winner of that fight, Dylan White, uh, Usyk, and if he starts losing multiple fights, his legacy won't be the same. Let me also say he won't get the money that he's going to get for the third fight against Tyson Fury. Right? Finally, let me close by saying this. Fury's win opens the door to a whole new group of heavyweights. 
Understand, the big clunky era is coming to a close. Now you have foot speed back in the heavyweight division. You have positioning back in the heavyweight division. Right? So, mindful of the fact that the guys who give Fury a hard time are smaller, quicker guys. By Fury's own admission, his toughest fight was against Steve Cunningham, who dropped him early in that fight. As Fury himself said, the punches that hurt you are the ones you don't see. Understand that the heavyweights we perceive as smaller heavyweights, even though they're not smaller when you look at the history of boxing, the Usyk's of the world. I think Usyk's 6'2", 6 6'3", 6 and we're calling him a small heavyweight. By the way, that makes him taller than Sonny Liston, right? The Usyk's of the world. The Michael Hunters of the world. Let me also say the athletes who are two-handed, who can move with Fury, right? Fury jumps in the pocket. The athlete who can throw punches off his back foot, right? Think Ray Robinson's anchor punch against Gene Fulmer. Think Salvador Sanchez dropping Wilfredo Gomez when Sanchez's back was up on the ropes. I'm just telling you Joseph Parker is going to be in play here, right? Let me also say, too, Usyk, Parker, Michael Hunter, who just fought to a draw against Alexander Povetkin, is going to be problematical. Let me say this, Povetkin, because Povetkin is an ambush fighter and moves well, is going to be problematical. Let's think outside the box. You have a big fight coming up at Cruiser. Big fight. Dordicos against Maris Breedis. Now, I'm just telling you, the toughest fight I've seen Usyk in, the toughest, was his fight against Maris Breedis. Understand, Breedis already KO'd heavyweight Manuel Char. If Maris Breedis, who's favored against Dordicos, beats Dordicos and then decides he's going to fight at heavyweight, Maris Breedis is exactly the kind of fighter who would give Tyson Fury problems, right? I don't think Fury would have a problem against Anthony Joshua or Dylan White. I think those are easy fights for Fury. Understand, we just saw Joshua dancing away from Andy Ruiz. I think Fury would have an easy time with Andy Ruiz, right? Understand, Joshua's just learning how to move. Joshua doesn't move like Tyson Fury, right? Fury has legs that can get him where he wants on demand. Joshua's reflexes, to me, aren't faster than Tyson Fury's. Fury is a guy who, because he can switch to southpaw, would be able to neutralize Joshua's jab. In fact, I privately feel Joshua is going to face a huge challenge fighting Kubrat Pulev. I expect Joshua to win that fight, but that's a competitive fight. Right? So understand, this is a watershed moment at heavy. Expect speed to be back. Right? If you don't believe me, just look at the Steve Cunningham Fury fight. Expect speed and movement to be back. Like Terence Crawford, Fury fights differently every fight, depending on his opponent. Even against the same opponent, this was a different Fury than the first fight against Deontay Wilder. So you saw great. Beat very good. Let me just say, too, let's see how far Fury and his new trainer, Sugar Hill, take it. Understand, Emmanuel Stewart, <clears throat> and everything's interrelated. Stewart, of course, was with Vladimir Klitschko, who 
Anthony Joshua has modeled his style after. Right? The thing with Emmanuel Stewart is he made punchers. Guys who danced. Guys who danced as amateurs. Thomas the Hitman Hearns. Right? As professionals under Emmanuel Stewart. They developed a style where they didn't dance as much. They planted their feet. They threw power shots. They set you up with jabs. Right? What you saw here was Stewart's protege, Sugar Hill, come up with a fight style where Fury is not throwing left hooks. He's planting his feet, he's moving, but he's not dancing. He's moving in at angles, and then he's roughhousing his opponent after throwing big right hands on the way in. Right? Fury might have found the trainer that would allow him to run roughshod over the heavyweight division. I still think he's going to have a hard time with Usyk. Let me close by saying, if Layla Ali comes back, I'll be one of those betting on Clarissa Shields. I have to run. Thanks for indulging me on this too long video. I hope you cleaned up this weekend big time. I'm Tyson Fury. Thanks for stopping by.